class of cross principles. And on the board it says, this will be the last teaching concerning death of this class. Because it's... The <laughs> yeah, but I mean of this particular course. <clears throat> Alrighty, go ahead and start your equipment, or you maybe you already did. All right, turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians in the book of the Bible, the New Testament. Galatians, the book of Galatians. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll read verse 20, and we'll also read verse 21. I am crucified. Are y'all okay with that? <laughs> I'm not just talking about me. <laughs> y'all going, we're really up for that, Randy, be crucified. <clears throat> I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And verse 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Okay, so these verses will um, be addressing uh, that thing of the law. Uh, we'll see it in several different places. <clears throat> but um, we've already dealt with I am. What are you? You Well, you are crucified. That's what you are. Well, I'm a Baptist. No, you are crucified. Um, you know, remember that the Baptist that followed John the Baptist ended up leaving him and following the Lamb of God. Is that okay? So, um, nevertheless, I live. <clears throat> and so from that, what we gain is that I am not annihilated in the sense of what most people would think when you read these scriptures. I'm not annihilated, um, but he says, yet not I. And he's talking about um, not your personality or the person he made you to be, but your old nature, what I would call my selfish life. Now, I know that your soul life or your selfish life or your flesh, I know that it has taken over your personality and used it to gain whatever you want <laughs> in different ways. Uh, but your personality will remain intact. But that old nature and you, if you are, as we discussed in the last class, if you are willing to not just be dead with Christ and that meaning your old nature, but if you are willing to be crucified with Christ, if you are willing to bear the cross and go to the cross and, and experience the crucifixion version of that meaning that you are judged and you are um, considered this or that or whatever and that you handle all of those things by the nature of the one who went to the cross um, that's why I no longer live but Christ lives in me that's the purpose of that um, and when the scripture says Christ lives he's not talking about it in the way that that most Christians are viewing it. When you go to a, the average church and you say, Jesus lives, they'll go, yeah, Jesus lives, you know? And then you go, where? In heaven, you know? Or after death, he got up. 
But they never really get to the fact that he lives in me because I'm crucified. And how important would that be? How important would it be for the father wanting his son and his nature in us so that we would um, um, live victoriously, but that's not even the first thing, or not live, by, not live in sin, that's not even the first thing, but live by the life of another. I am crucified, nevertheless I live, but not I. Christ lives in me, and it is the desire of the Father, it's, see, it's, when we discuss these things, it's not just the desire of the Father to have a plan whereby we will have an exchange life, not us, but Christ. Because that puts it all on a plan instead of the very heart of the Father for the Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Remember that? And there, if we never understand that, if we never see this in light of God, you know, God. If we never see that in light of God as represented by Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, by that which is eternal, by that which has always been there, by that which is the life flow of who God is, then we will only see it in, li in light of our little lives on this earth and what his death has done for me, not what it has done for the Father. By imparting, being the vehicle, the, the cross being the vehicle, de Jesus' death being the vehicle of the putting away of one life and the receiving of another. Now, <clears throat> you could say that not everybody on the planet just lives horribly bad. There are really good people that live a good life. <clears throat> I mean, if that were true, now we all have a fallen nature, so there's no denying that that's, you know, the Adamic nature is in all of us. Um, but if that were true, that there were some really good people that lived on this earth that really hardly never hurt anybody or did anything wrong, and they were really kind, and they blessed people and all of that, they still wouldn't be sufficient. Um, that would be a little bit like if you were a father and you had a son <clears throat> and somebody kidnapped your son and you're going, oh, my God, you know. And, and it wasn't a ransom. They weren't going to give your son back. And then somebody saw you on TV and they said, you know what? You can have one of my sons. I have, like, 12. You would go... No, that's not my son. You know, we have to understand that. We have to really, really understand that because a lot of times it's just God, just God instead of Father. And, and the very nature of it, Father, Son. Well, that was before a fa there was ever a Father or a Son on this planet. Before there was a planet. <laughs> Um, because that's the heart and soul of what we call the plan of God, but he calls I des the Father, I desire an increase of the life and nature of my son. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay. So that's, that's written in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4, chapter 4. And, and it's a statement showing this again more from the Father's side. We have, we have something. We have something. We may not live by it, but we have it because when you got born again, you got Jesus. You didn't just get salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Um, we have this treasure. And so the wording is used 
if Paul wrote that, which, which he did, and it's, it's known that the Apostle Paul wrote that, then God the Holy Spirit inspired him not just to say, well, we have Jesus in us in that way. There's a big difference between a treasure and a vessel, an earthen vessel, right? And so it's, it's making a huge contrast there. This is a contrast. This is, a, this is meant to um, uh, shatter our religious dullness and way of just perceiving because we were taught a certain way. And, and, I, and, and let me make this clear. I am not challenging you to go by my teaching or think the way that I think or whatever. My challenge is for you to go to the Holy Spirit and say, show me the Father's heart for the Son. Show me the Son. Reveal that Son in me. Let, let, the, let what I have in me no longer be a silent partner, except when I get in trouble. a silent part oh he's in there you got Jesus in yeah when's the last time you had any movement in you when's the last time when you prayed you thought about him being in you when's when was the last time well the answer would be the last time I had a crisis you know he's just a he's a fixer he fixes my crisis and then I, he, I keep him on retainer which means I don't see him or have anything to do with him until I have a major problem, and then he's there, and he's always on retainer so that I don't have to worry. I have somebody that's going to do it. Well, I would hope Jesus is more than a, a fixer, and I would hope that we have him more than just on retainer. You're crucified, and he's your life. Or, he's the treasure and you're just the earthen vessel. Yeah, but I'm an important earthen vessel. That's how we think. You know, I'm really an important. I have been fixing my cracks so that he couldn't shine through me. <laughs> and I, ha I put on some very expensive French perfume on my earthen vessel so that people would be impressed with me instead of him. And I, I do things to work on myself so that I will um, be looked upon as admirably or as admirable in Christianity. Sometimes when I'm talking, I hear this stuff, and I go, this is really the case, and it makes me sick because it, it just voids out the, the Lord, the very one we claim we all love, and it voids him out, and it just makes him a, not a treasure at all, and it really makes us the treasure in our minds while we're just an earthen vessel. So, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Christ lives. We've talked about this somewhere, probably in a blog that I did, not today, but last week, where... You know, the question arises then if you live, where do you live? Okay, well, the scripture says he lives in me. Okay, okay good answer. But if you're just answering that, that's not a good answer to God. There has to be the reality. And it's important to realize that of all the places God could live, who did, quote unquote, live in heaven, now he lives in you. If you understand that yes he still but I'm, just, I'm trying to make a point here that this says 
he does he not only lives at the right hand of God in heaven he lives in me okay and we treasure that and we treasure him enough to put him forth and to let him shine and let him let glory go to him and not to me and all of the things that we should do but we don't because we you know we get the the we get the chain brought forward and clamped around our neck and we're in front of the person that has the chain hooked to their clamp around their neck and then the person comes behind me and we all religiously walk along dull and unaware of the bright shining of the Lord by the Holy Spirit just in the wording, but we can't see it because we're content in our religion that we're good enough or that we're, all, we're well, you know, I know I need Jesus, but I'm not as bad as, you know, so-and-so, which comforts us. Um, <clears throat> But it's but pride is doing that. So we're we we may be comforted in it, but we are raising up the banner of pride in our heart, uh, and overshadowing the treasure of our heart. Okay. So why am I saying all this? Well, because I am just so intent on condemning condemning everybody. No, that is not why I'm doing it. I you know I have really. I really don't sit around thinking thoughts of what can I condemn people <laughs> for next. I think about the father's heart concerning his son. <clears throat> I think about what does this scripture mean? And all of a sudden it, the spirit of God begins to enlighten an eternal being, the father, an eternal being's heart toward his son. And I go, I have not even come close to honoring that. <clears throat> and yet we're all going to stand around a throne and we're going to go, well, we'll do it now because clearly you didn't put me up there. <laughs> you know. So I better just fit in with the earthen vessel group. Well, the time to do all that is now. The life I now live in the flesh, the rest of this the life I now live. <clears throat> I, I shifted around two words. I didn't replace a word or anything, but I just put it like this. The life, I, the life I live in the flesh now. The life I now live in the flesh. The life I live in the flesh now. And it went, woo! I mean, it means the same thing, but for some reason, it breaks the religious hold we have on that scripture so that it can, it can go, it can, the spirit of God can jump on it and go, okay. The life I live in the flesh now. <laughs> well, so l let's say that one of the things that I shared brought condemnation. <clears throat> The whole point would be to quicken our hearts for the Lord and say, you know, I have done that and I want you in the way that you should be honored. And Father, I want to honor your son in a manner that it would bring great glory to you. Not that I'm bringing glory to you, but that by me honoring the son and putting him before me as a treasure and me just an earthen vessel, that brings you honor because the sun brings you honor. You see, you, it's like, it's, you know, I was for years, uh, Deb and I lived in Jamaica as missionaries way back in the bush, and everywhere we went, we carry a machete. And, and it's like these thoughts, the thoughts that we have in all this stuff, it's like taking, trying to take a machete and cutting through all of it because we, it's, just, it's just one big forest, you know, and it's not even a forest, it's a jungle, one big jungle. And we can't divide it because 
so much religion has an and, and earthly viewpoint and self-centered viewpoint. I mean, Paul said, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for his sake. Okay? But so many sermons that you hear are, well, you can be stronger, you can be successful, or you can be prosperous, or you can, you, you know, you can overcome, or all of this stuff, and, you know, and so we're going, yeah, preach it to me. I got to listen to these tapes, man. They're going to make me something, you know? And, and am I trying to look down on those people or put them down? That's not my intention at all. But I can't help but when I see Jesus, I see a contrast and I go, ah, it bugs me. And it doesn't, it doesn't make me turn on them. It makes me turn on me and say, look, buddy, there's more to, of him to be known and to be lifted up. <clears throat> I just like how the Holy Spirit fell on that. Though. The life I live in the flesh now is the crucified life. <laughs> I am crucified with Christ. See that? See where that came from? I'm crucified. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me, but Christ too, the one I'm crucified with, lives in me. I, the life I live in the flesh now is the crucified life. That's the life I've been given. <clears throat> the one who went to the cross. God exalted the one who gave himself and said, this is the spirit of and the nature that I would like to rule over things. So we go, well, God raised him out of that spirit, and now we can exalt him. He goes, yeah, I really am the biggest, you know, <laughs> the big deal. No, it's not his spirit, and it's not the Father's spirit. He would no longer be on the throne if he moved into that spirit. The Father would remove him because he exalted that spirit that way in this one who deserved all glory, who deserved all honor, and went and got lower and lower and lower until, you know, became a man, and then as a man, he became a servant. As a servant, he became a criminal, and as a criminal, he was crucified for us. And we're all working the other direction because we don't see the spirit of of, we don't even see the spirit of the direction we're supposed to be going or the proper orientation. So wouldn't it be weird if God exalted the lamb slaughtered, the lamb slain, because of that spirit, put him on a throne, and then saved a bunch of people, brought them up, put them in heaven, and they're completely the opposite. They're going, we're going to be the greatest, and we're going to, you know, and we overcome, and we're this and that, and all this. And, and you know, and then they're told, worship that. What? No, no. But we want to see him seated on the throne looking victorious. Instead, he, he looks slaughtered. We want to see him on that throne touting the way that did it all, but we're talking about how I overcome the, came the devil, you know. Well, what's it say in Hebrews 2.14? Through death, he overcame him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Through death. Whoops. Whoopsie. Through death. He destroyed him is the word there, but through death. He overcame, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Okay, so, so cross principles is just a word we use. The cross, the crucified lamb, is, is eternally important. You, you'd go, okay, well, when we die and we stand before Jesus, he's going to go, okay, we're going to live happily ever after. The 
but then you're looking at the slaughtered lamb and you're going, okay, you sure this is going to be good? Well, I know what you, some of you are thinking. Well, then what is it going to be like? No, it's going to be like him. We're going to bear his image. That's, that's the father. If you said, Father, what's heaven? He said that everybody that there bears the image of their son, the slaughtered lamb. That would be heaven to me. And you go, gosh, that sounds so simple from your heart, but that's really your one big desire. Yeah. Well, what about saving all these people? I didn't just save them so they'd be saved. I saved them so that they could come into the image of my son. Amen? So, the life I live in the flesh now is the crucified life. That's the life I've been given. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. I live by faith in this way of living life. The life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in this way of living life. Okay. Well, see, if God just wanted us saved, now think about this. If God just wanted us saved, as soon as we got saved, he'd have just sent a big angel and knock us in the head with a big rod and kill us and bring us up to heaven. Right? Wouldn't that make sense? We go, well, that hurt, but I'm glad to be up here. <laughs> but that would make sense unless he had a greater plan than just us being saved. He did not have to put the son in us. He could have just had the son die for us. Now you're saved. I'm going up. See you when you get here. Right? But he put him in us because he wanted us to be conformed to the image of this son. This son. This one. I live by what the son of God lives by. Well, the first one was, I live by faith in this way of living life. I live by what the Son of God lives by. How do you do that? You do it because he's your life. <laughs> okay, so, so there would, to, to get there, there would have to be a leap of faith. It would, you would have to leave you and want him, right? Wouldn't that make sense? Okay, well, the, the, instead of it being like a chasm, and we're over here, and that life is over there, and we have to leap, and, you know, we all have to be springy because we've got to make this leap here. And we're, but it's a leap of faith, and I'm going for it. Instead, it's a little worse than that. He points to a cross where, where his son was slaughtered by men and says, I took care of you too. I took care of you. But I didn't just do it so you could say, well, it's all a finished work and everything makes me happy. I did it so that that life burst out of you. You would be, remember we talked about the, um, uh, the um, parable of the sower? I put that seed in you so that it could eventually burst out of you and bear fruit to the Father. So, so how it is through through the cross, through um, because the 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 salvation teaching of the cross isn't going to get you there. The, you're going to have to look closer in the scriptures to find all these places. But as you do, you will discover um, this is the plan. And when I say the plan of God, I mean this is the heart of God when he, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth. That he would show you what he's like by 
coming down from those heavens and living not just in the earth, but in earthen vessels, very earthly vessels. Okay? All right, well, I just thought for the fun of it, since we've got a few more minutes, we'd look at a couple other scriptures in Galatians that deal with this same thing. Look in chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 19, starting at verse 19. Galatians, book of Galatians in the Bible. Galatians 5, verse 19 through 25. <clears throat> now, the works of the flesh are manifest. Oh, boy. <laughs> so what what is it that we really want to manifest the nature of the lamb we want to manifest Christ we want but if we're still in the flesh if we have not embraced the cross as God meant it the full measure you, you understand me saying that not just salvation but the full measure of the cross to, to throw yourself at the foot of the cross and say I want to see what it means to be crucified with you, then if, if that hasn't happened and the Spirit of God hasn't enlightened your eyes, then you're going to manifest what? You. You. Okay? <clears throat> Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. And you've heard me note that Paul put and such like so that he covered literally everything that comes out of the flesh. <laughs> and by, by adding that, he said, I, I'm getting sick to my stomach writing this stuff. I don't want to go any further. It's everything like that comes out of this nature. <clears throat> Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit, shall not inherit. Okay? Well, to whom goes the inheritance? The firstborn. Maybe next class we'll talk about that tonight. <clears throat> the firstborn. All right. So usually all we do is grab that and go, oh, I want to inherit, you know. Jesus died, so I get the inheritance. <laughs> oh my God, I mean, just think of the spirit behind that. And we glorify that statement. It's like, I would go, I'm not the firstborn, to him be all glory, but I am part of his body, and he does live in me, and I'm happy for that, because that's my joy. And the father goes, I like you. I like you a lot. Amen? You please me because you're not after you. You're living in the earth and you have every pull going on around you and y'all, your main, I said y'all, God said y'all, did you hear? <clears throat> your main <laughs> goal seems to be something eternal, something I care about, something that is so in my heart why I started this in the whole beginning. You want my son to gain the things that he won't take to himself. He just keep, keeps getting more. Right? <clears throat> Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Okay, so... <clears throat> um, None of the things we just read are religious works of ministry. Well, I teach the children, I do this, I, I'm a missionary, I, uh, I have all these different kind of ministries. Um, you know, if you go to a pastor's conference or something and, uh, you know, you introduce yourself, well, people are going to say, well, what, what, what are you doing? You know, I mean, what? Basically, they're going to ask you, well, what kind of church do you have? Or what do you, you know, it's all about ministry. I mean, couldn't we just say, well, I'm, I'm really into uh, gentleness and long-suffering. And, you know, and this is my, that's my ministry, but I'm ministering to the Father because those are the attributes of the Spirit flowing through me by Christ. This is, this is what I'm really into. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? Whoa, 
that would be really cool if, like, if we just all here thought that way. <laughs> because, it, you know, it doesn't matter how popular your ministry gets, you know, like mine. <laughs> it doesn't matter how popular your ministry gets because you're going in the wrong direction. You're, you're focusing not on the things that he says, this is the kind of stuff that involves inheritance. <laughs> you're going to inherit, you know, I mean, like, like my mom had blue eyes and I inherited those blue eyes. And then my daughter, Naphtali, got my blue eyes. And then Bryce got her blue eyes. And then we inherited that because it just flowed down to us by oneness. Would you like blue eyes? <laughs> um, so it's not, an, uh, it's, you know, you don't, those kind of things, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, you don't get those. You inherit those by being one with the him, and it goes flows through his body. Would that make sense? But we're going, oh, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get every one of those, you know. And, uh, and I've seen it. I've seen them get on the chalkboard, you know, and this week we're going to cover long-suffering, you know, uh, and mark them all out and say, now this is the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to learn this. And you know, you know, all you need to do is walk up there and say, write, it, write all of that down. Say, this is the fruit of the Spirit, not your fruit. But He lives in you, and Christ lives in you. And look to the source instead of thinking you're going to be the source once you, I'm going to get this. You know. And let me tell you, one of the worst things you can try to do is be more loving. Because you'll usually get worse. <laughs> so, he says, love, joy, peace. Remember, this, he's not talking about any kind of ministry things. Well, we, we've got a lot of kids saved. Or we've, you know, we've written so many songs that affect people's hearts that keeps them tender. Or are, are y'all following this at all? Love, joy, peace. Whoa. If we could just be united with Jesus, that by the Spirit of God, he could bring forth those things the church would look completely different across the globe. It would look completely different. We'd say, this is what we're all striving for, more of Christ by the, through the means of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then what would happen? Okay, I, I admit it, ministries spring up, but they need to spring up and stay up by the, by the reality of nature. See, these are all things of nature, right? And, and what we've been talking about is that the nature of Christ, you know. So it's, it is totally ridiculous for us to go, hmm, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really pursue the fruit of the Spirit. Because it's not in our nature to be this way. I mean, we can try. We can fake it for a while. But when somebody crosses us or does something we don't like, well, then, woe be tied, Molly Walker. Anybody know what that is? Good. Um, it was a Latin curse I just put on you. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I am kidding, people. <laughs> okay, well, are you ready for, you thought the, the labeling or, or uh, listing the fruit of the Spirit was good. Are you ready for the next part? Yes. Okay, let's read it again. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Oh, no. Come on. 
Get it. Grab it. It's there. It's screaming. The Spirit of God, like, is behind the word. You can see the, each letter, and he's right behind it, ready to jump on you. And, this is what it means. It's talking about Jesus. Against such there is no law, as if to live this way is to not live under the law. Well, I thought it was throwing out the commandments. Well, I thought it was this or that. I thought it was, you know, um, to, to no longer be under the old covenant. I'll be under the new covenant. I'm saved by grace and I can do whatever I want, but I'm still going to heaven. <laughs> but he's saying, this is it. This is how you, there is no law against this. This is not, you can't live under the law with this. This is not, how did I write it here? Against since there is no law, as if to live this way is what not living under the law is all about. It's all about, all about Christ's nature coming to us. It's about nature, first of all, but it's about Christ's nature. Okay, well, we said that, didn't we, when we just listed the fruit of the Spirit, but we just added something. This is the secret for not living under the law. You live by Christ. Amen. By the way, a new covenant will I make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart. I will put my spirit into them. I will, how did he word that? I will be their life, I, you know. And the, the whole new covenant is, I will, and I'll do it in you. But we go, okay, I'm saved now. How do I do it? <laughs> and he said, I'll do it in you. Remember the new covenant? Remember, remember that? And Ezekiel and Jeremiah, don't you remember when I said, that? I'm, I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm tired of your sacrifices and offerings because they don't have the right spirit. They don't have the fragrance. They, they're missing this fragrance I really like. Christ, the selfless Christ, the beauty of the Lamb of God. They, they don't have, I can just hear the Father say, I don't, I'm, I'm tired of them. They're just, they don't satisfy me. They don't touch my heart. They don't, there's, they're, they're you know, and we can say it's just, it's the fragrance just isn't right. Or he could say, the, the fragrance is a stench in my nostrils because it's not my son. I know all I ever asked from you was I wanted my son. I just love that, though. Against such, there is no law as if this is what it means. This is what the Father means. This is what he had in mind. This is what he means. This is the freedom. Stand fast. This is, by the way, in this uh, same chapter of this book. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the loke of, yoke of bondage, with the loke of yondage, <laughs> which is also very dangerous, the loke of yondage. But for all of this to come, for all of this to fill us, for all of this to get us, you know, it needs to get us before we're going to be filled. It needs, we're trying to get it, it needs to get us. I mean, you change your prayers. You say, oh God, I've got to get this. And instead, you, you start saying, oh Lord, make this stuff get me. Sick me. Sick of me. <laughs> You know, because I, and, and the deal is you can say to him, Father, I just want what you want. And I know that it's what the son is what you want. So you need to get this stuff to get me because you said, in, I mean, I've said stuff like this, especially early on. I've said stuff to him like, I know I should have been struck dead, but I said stuff like, 
Like, look, the, you're the one who said, you, I, I will put these laws in your heart and everything. They're not in my heart. I am the opposite. I am very, very bad, God. <laughs> your son is not here. And, you, you know, you're going to look like a failure if you don't do it in me. Do you ever see that before? Moses used that tactic. Well, God, if we don't, if I don't bring him out of the wilderness, everybody's going to say, "Well, you you couldn't do it." Remember that <laughs> he said that, yeah. So, so I, I just said, and if I'm wrong, blame Moses. He's the one with the law. <laughs> so, you know, I you know I I've done that over and over on so many different levels where I just go, look, I. I, I want you, I'm truly, I truly, really do, I'm hard-headed, I'm, I stray easily, but, you know, and, and, but you're a shepherd. You know, I mean, I'm always, I'm always going back to, you, you, you're my hope. See, it's not blaming, really, it's just like, are, are you going to do this? You know, because you said you would, you know, and, and he, he did, I don't think he has a problem with that. I don't. I think that he goes, well, finally somebody is at least looking at the scriptures and seeing that my heart, I said I would do it. And so you start praying that way instead of being a good Christian that's going to get it. Just say, none of us had it until you made this covenant, and then you said you'd do it. Verse 24, and they that are Christ's, what? Okay, so they that are Christ. What does it mean to be Christ's? Have crucified. <laughs> it's verse 24. And they that are Christ, so I just wrote, because I do that, I just wrote in, in parentheses in there, what does it mean to be his? Have crucified. See, because they that are Christ, my little thing, what does it mean to be? His have crucified. Thank you for answering that, Father. Okay, so what am I saying? <clears throat> what is he saying? He's saying that it's all, it all goes back to being crucified with Christ. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the lust, with the affections and lust. And the word lust isn't sexual lust. You can look it up. It's just desires that are from the flesh. I mean, that could be, you know, a cupcake or something. I don't know. You know, I'm just, you know. <laughs> never, never mind. It couldn't be a cupcake. I'm getting dirty. I'm getting dirty looks. <laughs> just kidding. But you know, it is that. It is that spirit and nature and that's all he's saying he's saying the lamb gave himself and see he already said that in chapter two so he doesn't have to repeat all that again in chapter five is that right he shouldn't have to repeat it all he shouldn't have to every time and we go well where does this come from and, you know and what you know but we do that because we don't take it. As, I mean, if somebody wrote you a letter and they said, you know, this here and this here, and then you get on page three and they're saying something here, do you forget that this is one letter? And you go, oh, yeah, yeah it's a whole letter. And here's what they said. We go, but we do it with the Bible. We go, oh, okay. Now, what is all this? Where did this come from? Crucified? What's that? Well, it's in the first part of the letter. <laughs> <clears throat> and since we are one minute out from stopping, let's, let's real quick just go to Galatians 6 and read it, although it's going to be difficult for me to keep my mouth shut. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. We do have. We started a little late, not because of certain people but because of me talking and carrying on like I do. All right, Galatians 6, 11 through 16. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand? He's trying to make a point that this was important to me to get this information to you. 
As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So, if you'll cut off your own flesh, circumcision, but this is saying they don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ because circumcision is the hot sub subject in the nation, in the religious nation, in this case of Israel. But if you start preaching the cross, then there's going to be some repercussions. Huh? <clears throat> Unless you suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now what he's going to tell you Again, now remember, same book, same letter, so he doesn't have to repeat everything, but he's going to add something to that in the same thing that he said up to this point. Verse 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So they say if you get circumcised, you're keeping the law. Well, the law was, circumcision was never a thing of the law. Originally, it was given to Abraham, and this was before the law, and we're not going to reteach other parts of Galatians. <laughs> um, it's almost like there's a theme going on through this book somehow. <clears throat> um, and notice that he's talking about keeping the law. And they that are Christ's have crucified these things and now love, joy, peace. You see that? They that do such things have never been under the law. This is not under the law and is not dictated by law but by nature. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Okay, so they're glorying in circumcision or we can say they're glorying and cutting off their own flesh to because because the preacher said, you know, you need to get rid of your sin, you need to be better, you need to da-da-da-da, you know, and so you start trying to cut all that out of you, right? Without the cross. And you're trying to measure up within the religious community. All right, so Paul says, but I'm not going to glory in that. They want to glory in your flesh because that means you're working hard to fulfill our religious expectations. But he's saying, I am different. Um, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we would all, and you know this, but we would all go, oh, yes, I glory in the cross. It doesn't matter what denomination. I glory in the cross by whom he died. That's not what this said, but by whom he died so I could be saved, so that I could be happy, so that I could, you know, not have any more guilt, so that I could, oh, I glory in the cross 2,000 years ago. And he's saying, I glory in the cross by whom I am crucified to the world, and the world is crucified unto me. It's, it's almost like he's swinging a great big sword of crucifixion that's just cutting down everything as it goes. Right? Okay? <clears throat> and uh, verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. He's saying, you know, in Jesus, if you're in him, if you're one with him, if you're his body and you have his nature, getting circumcised doesn't do anything. Um, it doesn't avail anything. Nor uncircumcision because God could care less about the outward. He's more interested in the inward. He put his son in you. I am crucified. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. Christ lives within me. You remember that one? <laughs> and he's, again, he's not going to reshare all that every time he says something that we get confused about. It's always going to be the cross. And it's always going to be crucifixion. This is the third time it's really just flat out said our crucifixion. Amen? Amen. Um, nor uncircumcision but a new creature or a new creation. Okay? Well if any man be in Christ in union with Christ he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold all things are become new and all things are of God. They're not of you. Okay? 
verse 16, and as many as walk according to this rule, <laughs> ah, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So he's saying that this is the Israel of God now. This is the true walking with God. This is what he had in mind when he raised up Israel. This is the fulfillment of the old covenant. This is the new covenant. And the new covenant is fulfilled in Christ crucified, but in bringing us into that crucifixion with him and agreeing with him and pursuing him because we're pursuing his nature. And we want, see, being crucified to the world is... I'm crucified by Christ, so that has no power over me in the world. See? But it does have power over you. It has no power over the nature of Christ that is within you. So why do we say he must increase and we must decrease? Why? Why would we make such a big deal out of that? I rest my case. This class, I rest my case. All right. So this is the last of this particular class. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you by your spirit to make real the, the issues of your heart, to make real the issues that flow from that heart of yours. Oh, hallelujah. We want a flow from your heart. We don't just want to have Bible knowledge. We want to reach into the very depths of your heart and live there, and from there have what flows out of us flow back unto you for your glory, Father, by Christ, through Christ Jesus. Therefore, we ask it in his name, not ours. In Jesus' name.